it's truly a great grace to gather together of the novena of the child Jesus because of what we will speak this year, the victory of Our Lady. The victory will arrive. The victory will come through Mary. What would she like? And the and the measure possible in an hour for us to reflect, to cooperate with her victory. Where does the victory begin? How will it be carried out? The victory of God in Our Lady, we spoke in the last class, the victory of God in Mary through her is the Immaculate Conception. That is the first moment that Our Lady crushes the head of the serpent by a, a direct grace of the Holy Trinity in her. And what is the second or the second moment where she obtains a great victory for God? And the Annunciation. And I want to begin because I think that all of Advent and everything that we have from here until the birth of our Lord, the prologue of St. John, should be a, a meditation theme every day because every word is truly a double-edged sword for us and that penetrates profoundly. Sister, did you go? Can you play a little bit? I want to read quickly because the prologue is very long. I want to read. I want you to listen well. Please close your eyes and listen to what St. John understood, fully understood, after living with the Blessed Virgin Mary. She writes. He writes his gospel already elderly, very elderly. Therefore, the prologue is the fruit of the dialogue of the heart of she who is the mother of the Word made flesh, this dialogue with, with her. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life. And this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was the truth. And we have contemplated its glory. I don't know. I don't know if, if you meant it, but every word opens the horizon. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we saw His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The Word is God, the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity. And how many times we have thought about this, and everything was done because of the Word. And what is the everything? Creation. The Word, the work that the work of the Father was done in virtue of the Word. That is, who told the Father, why don't we create? Why don't we create something beautiful, something beautiful that culminates 
with the crown of creation, which is a human person. The second person of the Trinity said it, even though the creative work is a Trinitarian work. The word is light. Light, that's why we put lights on the trees and in decoration because the word is light. We are in days of light. And we have to ask the Lord that His light may illumine us and illumine humanity that's in darkness. Our world is in darkness, brothers and sisters. And in the middle of this world of, of darkness, there are little lights. And those that's us, we who have received the Lord, who have embraced the Lord like our Savior, our Redeemer, and we've listened to His word and we have received him in the sacraments. And now here we see the great battle between the light and the darkness, between the word of the Lord and the word of who? Of the enemy and of men. Because the word of the Lord is not the same as the word of men. That's why he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And this is very strong, brothers and sisters, Be to place the battle and the word of the Lord against the word of Satan. Well, that's easy. But in our word, the one that we believe, the one that we believe that we have the judgments, the thoughts, the correct ideas when they're simply, perhaps good, but simply human. Do you remember when Peter told the Lord, no, you can't go to Jerusalem. And what did Jesus, what did Jesus tell Peter? Get away from me, Satan, because your thoughts are of men. That is, when we are not transformed by the word of the Lord and we continue attached to our own thoughts, human thoughts, and we don't have the divine logic, but we have human logic, in one way, without wanting it, we can engage in the game with Satan. That was the gospel today, the last phrase of the gospel. It says that the Pharisees and the scribes, because they couldn't open themselves to what the Lord was saying, they interrupted the plan of God in them. And now, we brothers and sisters, we have to understand that this word, like St. John says, is the light that shines for all men. And this is very important today. Christ is not only for Christians. Christ is for the world, the entire world, that needs to listen more than ever to the proclamation of the gospel, which is the truth about God and about man. Now, it's told, no, you can't speak about that. We have to respect. Since when has it been that when we tell the good to the other, it's disrespectful? Since when has it been that we share the treasure we have found is disrespectful? It's a plan of Satan to avoid the new evangelization. The world did not know it. Why? Why some yes, why some no? Do you realize that some receive it and others no? And what, what is the foundation of that distinction? Humility. The humility of Our Lady. To tell God, only you have words of eternal life. I don't. No one else does. Only you, Lord. 
But those who believed in that word, even though it was difficult in some moments, even though it was, it, even it, it was contradictory to our flesh, even though it, it struck us, we remain fixed in that word. And those who those are the ones who attain true freedom. But there are others who don't because because it seemed very difficult. And we're going to speak about that. We are in the heart of Advent, brothers and sisters. And it's impossible to live this season, this beautiful liturgical period. For me, it's my favorite one without turning our gaze towards whom? Our mother. Why? Because there's no Advent without Our Lady. The mother of the first Advent and the mother of every Advent until the end of the until the end of time. I didn't say that. John Paul II said it. Mother of all Advents. Not only the liturgical Advents that we live as a church, but the Advents in your own heart because God wants to do a work in you and me every day. Therefore, we live in a constant Advent. God wants to be born in a new way in us every day. Without the maternity of Our Lady, there is no Advent. Without her, there is no Savior. And we have to be clear. We need to direct our gaze towards she whose fiat, yes, she opened her heart, she opened her virginal womb so that the Holy Spirit can conceive in her the greatest work of all history. Creation is not the greatest work, even though they want to tell us yes, no, brothers and sisters. The greatest work is the incarnation. A God who becomes man. And not even a 30-year-old man. A man, well, we say today that he's, he's a little cell or a molecule, no. A God becomes a babe in the womb of a mother. That creation, that moment, I would like to see it in a little hole, but we can't. But that moment that the mother answers in faithful obedience to the word that she's listening, and she's, what she says is very important. Ten words, like ten commandments in the Old Testament. She said ten words. And the first is, let it be done. Un let it be done. The creative word. What did the Lord say every time he was going to be, he was going to create something? Let there be light. Let there be land. What did Our Lady say? Let, it, let, there, be, let there be a new creation. The new creation of God that let that be, let that take place in me according to his word. But and sisters, we want a new creation in us. Let us tell the Lord, let it be done unto me according to your word. But when he chooses how to do it, don't complain. Because he knows the how. Like he knows when. And he knows why. Our mother is the heart of the incarnation. In her, God becomes man. In her, the greatest mystery of light is guarded in her womb. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what we will do in this world so that we understand what the maternal womb is. The the temple of life, the temple of life, and that mystery of the incarnation that transcends us 
And yes, it transcends us. We understand it, we penetrate it, we have to understand it as much as possible. Brothers and sisters, it transcends us, it moves us. That's why we cry so much when we go to Bethlehem. And we walk in that line to go down to the cave and we're crying because it transcends us to to think that our God is a God who became a babe. Our God is born in a manger of straw, but very well organized straw because St. Joseph organized it with the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's why we cannot go unnoticed in Advent at this moment and in the topic in which we're at the because within the victory, because when the victory of Our Lady is the victory of the Word. But sisters, without the Word of the Lord, the world cannot have peace. Without the Word that's light unto a path, where are we headed? Where are we going? That's why there's so many mistakes, so many, so much confusion, so many interpretations. There's more interpretations when there's only one that's worth it sacred scripture <laughs> interpreted officially by a charism that the Lord gives the church and then it's applied to your own life and then it's applied to your own life if you know how to read it with the heart of Our Lady Our Lady is full of the word the word triumphed in her and if you notice Blessed are those who listen to the word and obey it. Who is the one who listened to it and obeyed? Our Lady, all of her life. Since she was a girl. I don't know who heard my radio program on Sunday, so I don't repeat. Well, of course, the majority didn't. Baba and sisters, at three years of age, try to think of a grandchild, a daughter, a three-year-old. I'm privileged to be born on that day. But at three years of age, the Blessed Virgin Mary is is offered at the temple. Saint Joachim and Saint Anne don't understand who she is, but they understand that it's someone who has a very special grace. And if it's a special grace, because it was a miracle, Saint Anne was ancient. It was a miraculous birth, but. They must have received from God the intuition that this little girl was someone big. And what do those parents do? They turn her into the most sacred place because we take care of the sacred things. Sacred people, we take care of them. Everything that's sacred is taken care of, is very well taken care of. And they're placed in the most sacred place. And for them, it was a temple. And the most beautiful thing, brothers and sisters, according to great mystics, share with us and approved mystics that they have seen the moment of the presentation of Our Lady in the temple. And at that time, the temple was complete. Therefore, there was lots of stairs. And that little three-year-old, let us try to imagine to see if our deepest if the depths of our hearts are moved. That little three-year-old hugs her parents and then she, she climbs the stairs quickly to the temple without ever looking back. She already began to be the living gospel because Jesus would say that when I call you, don't look back because the one who looks back is not worthy of me. But the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's why it's important to understand these things. In the time of Our Lady, women didn't study the Word. Even in the synagogue, you notice, men entered, the women were in the back. They didn't study Scripture. Only men did. But those girls that were offered at the service of the temple, the ones that were more pure, more virtuous, the one that 
that was perceived an aura of holiness, they were elevated to another degree. And those little girls were given the teachers of the law. They gave classes personally, sacred scripture. So imagine if she was the most virtuous, the holiest, the purest. So Our Lady was formed in the temple about sacred scripture. That's why she knew the scriptures so well. All of them privileged like a woman of that time. There's many things that happen in the temple that don't go with this, but it goes with everything how God puts order to everything, brothers and sisters. These girls were the ones in charge of purifying the lamb. She had to clean the little lamb because they had to go without any stain. Well, the one that didn't have any stain had to clean the little the lambs that the people would bring so that when they go to the sacrifice, they would were white, white, immaculate. So think about the relationship with the cross. And then after they slaughtered the lamb and offered in sacrifice of immolation to God the Father, those girls were the ones who picked up the blood. How God prepares everything how God prepared our Blessed Mother, making her immaculate, does not only prepare her for the Annunciation, but also prepares her to be to be prepared in the temple for the sacrifice. That's why the Council says that Our Lady consented to the immolation of her son. Everyone reads it but doesn't understand. Do you know what it is to consent? to give permission. She consented to the immolation of Christ. And she said, let it be done to me according to thy word. And we know that that moment, the, according to he Hebrew, Jesus was saying, I'm using terminology that we understand. Meanwhile, he came down from heaven into the womb of his mother. Hebrew says that Jesus said, behold, I come, Father, to the world to be, to do your will. The two wills, the mother and the son, in one love and obedience to the Father. The fiat of Our Lady is a powerful response. Powerful, brothers and sisters. It was a perfect yes. Because you know that we say yes, but like we take a step forward and one step back. That's why the Lord say that, that your yes be a yes and your no be a no. The yes of Our Lady is the most perfect yes that a creature could give because it was an immaculate yes. It was a yes completely given. It was a yes with a creative power. So much so, that the Incarnation takes place. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Jesus told us in Revelation, John Paul tells us in Revelation, that Jesus said, I came, all, I came to make all things. This is powerful. Repeat it with strength. I come to make all things new. That is, what does Christ want to do with you, with me? To make us new. And sometimes I think we don't under fully understand that we have to leave the old self. And if there's some little stain of the old self, we are not pure lambs. Because Christ came to make all things new. Do you know what's the first thing new that Christ did? His own mother. Because remember that it's by virtue of the sacrifice of Christ that God the Father makes her new. She is the only creature that is born without original sin. We just celebrated it. Who is the cause of our joy? The conception of Mary. Because she is the first new thing. 
But later, there's something newer. A God who becomes man to redeem us and save us and to make us new. And if you read the Gospels, you will see how many times the Lord uses the word new. You can't put wine, a new wine in old wineskin. Why? Because what happens to the wineskin? And so the Lord cannot put all of His redeeming grace in us if we maintain the old self in us. Because that grace is wasted. That's what St. Paul said. Please don't let the grace to fall in broken sackcloth. When the miracle of Cana, a new wine and an old wine, a new one and a better one. The fiat of Our Lady is a proclamation of love, brothers and sisters. And at the same time, I consider a battle cry, a victory cry. Because she said, yes, let it be done unto me according to the word of God. What did Satan say? I know. No, I will not serve. What did she say? Yes, I am the servant of the Lord. It's a battle cry in the simplicity as our mother does all things. So can you imagine when she said that, yes, a part that the world was at the in suspense, heaven in suspense, all who had died in the Old Testament in suspense. If Our Lady would fulfill that promise of Isaiah 7. And how was Satan? How was Satan at that moment waiting to see if she would be faithful to the love that she received? If she would be faithful to the call received? and how Satan must have ground, grinded his teeth when she said, Behold, the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to thy word. But and sister Satan will grind his teeth every time that we say yes to the Lord. Anytime he asks you anything, if you say yes, there's a victory. There's a triumph of God because every yes has a purpose. Everything that God asks of us has a purpose. And when we say yes, we are allowing God to fulfill His plan of love for humanity. It's a canticle victory. The victory that the Savior would come to the world through Mary and will continue doing so forever. The fiat of the Blessed Virgin Mary changed history. And that's why every time that she enters into history in many ways, she's changing history. She's changing the culture. The most important thing is that it's changing hearts. But when one goes to a place of apparition, what does one see? what you don't see on the street. Because she enters a place. Why does she enter a place? And then all of a sudden people want to pray. Why do people want to go to confession? Why does charity begin to surface in the hearts of people? Why do people get the rosary? Why does her presence have so much power to change us? because she who is all of God can only bring everything of God when she comes to us. Her yes becomes an open path for the powerful action of the intervention of God in history, in human history. Notice how powerful is the entrance of God in history, that is, the Incarnation that one of the great battles that we struggle with is 
They want to take remove the before Christ and after Christ since they want to eliminate Christ from anything you have to do with society and history. Well, now they also remove that, that we have the before Christ and after death. So why are they bothered so much about that? Because history was divided in two. And beginning with the birth of Christ, only sheep or sheep exist. Only the followers of Christ exist or the who are not with him. Even Christ said it, that who is not with me is against me. History was divided and history was defined. And we, but sisters, are are tranquil sitting here, but we have to ask ourselves daily, where is our conversion? Are we truly faithful to the grace received? Because you know what? I don't want to sound like some, but, but that's the truth of our faith. We say it even in the creed. You nor I know when the Lord will come again. Hopefully he could come tomorrow. We don't know when, when he comes to look, to come get you. Are we ready? Are we prepared, holy and immaculate in love? As St. Paul says, the Lord entered and didn't enter through the wide door. We're not going to enter the kingdom with the wide door. And he said that. In the kingdom, one enters through the narrow gate. How he entered. That's how you have to kind of bend down to enter into Bethlehem in the cave. A god that doesn't, a, a king who has nowhere to be born and no one opens the, their homes for him. Brothers and sisters, what we're trying to say is that if the word doesn't confront us or question us, what are we going to do? If I get upset because they didn't say hi to me, remember that the Lord rejected your Lord, crucified him, and you were in that world because it was your sins and my sins. What does Our Lady want? Our Lady wants our hearts to be like hers, that we may be a home of the Word. My brothers and sisters, to be a home of the Word. And in that, I admire our, I admire our separated Christian brothers and sisters. Since I entered the charismatic renewal at, 12, at the age of 12 years and a half, I was a good charismatic. I was with my Bible always. And you know what? Our Lady is so much order because when I told her mother, I want to know more your son. Do you know where she first led me? To the charismatic renewal where I met by the power of the Holy Spirit, the word of the Lord. I don't know how to walk without sacred scripture. I don't know how to understand life or read reality without sacred scripture. I would not know how to do anything if I don't have the light of sacred scripture. But she, why do I say in order? Because she, the first first entered her heart in, in her heart and then the word was made flesh. She made me know Christ in his word so that then I would know him in person in the Eucharist. Well, I don't think we need to be Protestant to carry the Word. I don't think we need to be Protestant to engrave the Word in our hearts. Do you know what we have to do? We have to be Marian. Our Lady carried the Word, all the entire Word in her heart. She carefully kept it. She treasured it. Everything that she saw of Jesus, because it's not only what she heard, but what she saw, the gestures, the acts, the silence, suffering, the choices, everything. She is the one who contemplated everything up close and guarded everything where? In her heart. And that's why Our Lady doesn't have anything superficial because she's a woman that has 
an interiority that we don't even have words to describe. In the heart of Our Lady, everything of Jesus is guarded there, is kept there. It's like difficult to understand. She guards everything of Jesus. Why do you think she insists in the Holy Rosary that we pray it? Because the Rosary is the Gospel, the Living Gospel. But she wants us to walk with it, to walk it with her because she lived the mysteries alongside her, her son. She is the fecund soil of the seed of the Word so that it can fall and bear fruit. And why does it bear fruit, brothers and sisters? Because she doesn't do what we do. What was the gospel today? What was the gospel yesterday? What was the first reading? The first readings of Advent are my favorite because they're all the promises, the promises of a Savior. But sisters, we have to learn. I'm not saying because according to the capacities, but I'm not saying that you learn that in Isaiah 61, verse 4, it says this and this and this. No. If you can't do so, great. Because if our Christian brothers can do so, we Catholics should do it more. But to understand what it says, why do Catholics stay so quiet? Because they don't know how to respond with the word of the Lord. How did Jesus defend himself from Satan with sacred scripture? And we and notice how much Satan detests sacred scripture, which is what he uses, what does he use to try to tempt Jesus? Sacred scripture. He hates so much the plan of salvation that he even learns scripture. So long as he could tempt Jesus. And you don't think that Jesus realized this? He says, oh, you're using the word of my father? Here is a stabbing. The, the word of my father, but well used. Because even though Satan may learn it by memory, he doesn't know how to use it. Because only love knows how to give a home for the word. And so he was throwing temptations against our Lord that were out of place. He thought in his perverse logic that they were perfect, but the logic of love and obedience of Christ, it was totally out of place. And that's why Jesus was able to, to return it with a word that truly crushes the head of the serpent. We have to be like that, but sisters, we have to be like Our Lady that since she was little, she studied, she meditated, she contemplated the Word. For those who tell me how many offenses against our mother, and we're a little better amongst Catholics because I'm not speaking about anything else, anywhere else, but how many offenses I've heard when, I, when they say Our Lady didn't even know whom she was receiving. The ignorance is daring. She knew perfectly well. She had studied who the Redeemer and the redemption would take place through suffering. Isaiah 53. Her yes is not a yes that's not informed, even though not fully informed but in the entire future, but the future was her present and her was her past. It's the word of the Lord. She knew what she was assenting. Brothers and sisters, our mother, since she was a little girl, the reading that Sister Anna said, I yearn to listen to the word of the Lord. Jeremiah says it also. Be thirsty for the word of the Lord. Our Lady had it. And we had the privilege that our mother would know fully the word of the Lord. And that the word in her by her yes would become flesh. And that the word which is becomes flesh in every Eucharist, that's why the order of the Mass is perfect. 
because what's first proclaimed the word and what happens afterwards the liturgy of the Eucharist the word that by the power of the Holy Spirit becomes flesh and donates himself to us now if we're distracted in the word the potency of what God is, what does it do in the Mass is stays halfway. Because that word that becomes flesh in the consecrated host wants to become flesh in you when you receive the consecrated host. I, I'm touched deeply, and it's a very special reading for me, my life, Isaiah 51, because I think of Our Lady. And like a little finger, I think of my life. Being young, even before going to the world, brothers and sisters, for your children, grandchildren, being young, even before going to the world, I sought wisdom in prayer and in word. In front of the temple, I asked for it until my last day. I will look for it. That's why we have to have uh, Scripture handy and then if not, have the four Gospels because we have to look. I'm not saying stop in the middle of the path to open the Bible, but every day we have to fill ourselves in prayer, the read, prayerful reading of the Gospel. If not, we'll not transform our way of thinking. When I found her, that imagine your your heart would rejoice from listening to the word. My foot advanced in rectitude. I didn't say uh, rectitude, not rigidity. My foot advanced in rectitude. Because since my youth, I have found the foot, foot, footprints of his word. I inclined my ear and I received it. And I found myself a great teaching. Thanks to her, I have advanced. And I always put it in practice. I had in short time, I paid heed. I met with great instructions. This way I have profited. When we're immersed with the word of the Lord, and to put into practice, we will never be confused as the word of the Lord. That's why all the saints say that whoever is with Our Lady does not err because, because Our Lady is full in her heart with the word of the Lord. Of what will she speak? Of what will she speak? Of Jesus. The favorite topic of Our Lady, what is it? Jesus. And, and of Jesus, after Jesus, then it's us, her children. And that was Sirach 51, not Isaiah. Sirach 51. My, my soul fights for her. Yes, we have to fight for her because for the word of the Lord. We have to. Oh, I don't feel like today. Well, yes. Fight for it because when you win, because sacrificial love would lead you to heaven. But to get to heaven, we have to know how to live here. The word of the Lord teaches us not only to die, it teaches us above all to live. So we could die saying, Behold your servant. I have done what you have entrusted me to do. In purity, I found her, and my heart remained fixed in seeking its word. Come close to me, those who desire wisdom, and take up lodging in the house of instruction. What is the house of instruction? The house of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, in wisdom, grace, stature, and which is not bodily, is the stature of human maturity 
and in grace before who? Before God and man. How long will you deprive yourself of wisdom's food? How long endure such bitter thirst? Here it's freely given. Sit in front of Our Lady with Scripture in hand and say, Mother, teach me to read it as you lived it because she will read it not as a book. She will share with us her memories the sacred scriptures so guarded in her heart that they become the memory of Our Lady. What does she remember? And what does she speak to St. John about? Of all the memories of Christ. Of all the memories of her own life. That's why the Gospel of St. John is the most theological one because it had the great theologian as a teacher. And why theologian? Because she she earned a, a PhD? No, because the theologians are not the ones that have a PhD. The theologians are the ones that know how to see the things of God with a gaze of the heart. That's why the saints are called theologians of the heart. Our mother is the living gospel that teaches us to read Jesus as such as he is. It hurts me that we Christians, we speak about Jesus, and Jesus told me, and Jesus told me, and I'm not going to judge if Jesus said it but didn't say it. But everyone says that Jesus said something. And sometimes there's things that are so illogical that I don't think Jesus would say them. And you know that we have, when you perceive something in your heart that Jesus is telling you, go and confront that word with the gospel to see if it's true that Jesus said it. One time a lady told me, today I feel this this courage, because that could mean a lot of things. No, I don't feel that. I feel like a, a weight has been lifted from me. And I said, wonderful, fabulous. How did that happen? And she said, because I've been in the best sacrament for three, hour, uh, three hours, and Jesus told me one word. And what did he tell you? It's because I have someone that I can't see, like not even like right in front of me. And so I'm like waiting to see what Jesus said. She said, I feel like this unloaded. And Jesus told me that I don't even have to forgive her. But the person was convinced. Because, because look at the discernment. Because if, if she damages me and gives me anxiety, the Lord wants me in peace and free. And I don't even have to see her or forgive her. And I said, well, present me that Jesus that makes your life so easy because my life isn't that easy. Brothers and sisters, we laugh, right? But it can happen to anyone. This is a very drastic event, which is easy to see. But Jesus says, that when there are things that sometimes are unjust that we don't understand, let us keep silent like he did in the Passion. Wasn't the Passion the greatest injustice that you can do to someone? And he wasn't just anyone. He was the God-made man who came to love and save. He is justice. And what, is ju what does Jesus do? He stays quiet. That's why we have to read the Gospel and not like a soap opera. We have to read it with the pain and suffering and fleshed to guard silence like Our Lady. Like, look, mothers, if you see, if, if one of your children is being scourged unjustly, won't you go out run to hit the soldiers? And the Our Lady was there holding everything, receiving in the interior of her being, every scourge. 
but she couldn't be unfaithful to the word of the Lord. She couldn't be unfaithful to Isaiah 53. She knew that she had to go through all that to save us. And we see that in that response that our mother says, let it be done to me, I am the servant of the Lord. What you want, do it, let it be done to me, because what we love to say is, yes, Lord, I want to do your will. But when it's a difficult, what do we do? What do we say? Lord, all I want to do is your will. Look, we're very cozy here in Bethlehem, warm. And all of a sudden, Herod wants to kill the, the child. Leave. Yes, that is the will of the Lord that get up from the comfort zone of the warmth of Bethlehem to go to the cold in the desert. Were they complaining? But sisters, that's to tell us the truth is that there's a lot to grow in me, to be faithful and docile to the will of the Father. And we see in our lady a profound listening and all of the Old Testament to the New, the lack of listening to God is considered a sin. And the root of all sin in the Old Testament and the New one is the lack of listening. That's why Jesus answers this. Blessed are the ones who listen to the Word and put it into practice because but we can't put anything into practice that we have not truly listened to. To listen is not an action that's simply just this, like auditory, because sometimes listening doesn't come with a voice. The listening is knowing how to see what God is telling you, directing you to, what God is indicating to you and its most profound meanings. Our Lady said, St. Luke, look how important this is for St. Luke, that Our Lady kept all things carefully, carefully in her heart. And he says it four times in his Gospel. Our Lady not only listens, but then what does she do? She treasures. What a beautiful word. To treasure means to discover that that word is a treasure. That we, what did what the man do that went out to look for a treasure and when he found it, he probably shot it for joy and then what did he do? He buried it for what? So no one could steal it from him until he went to sell everything and buy it. And so the word of the Lord, we have to do the same thing. If today, one word, and all of Scripture, touch me, hit, treasure it. Hide it in your heart. Take it to prayer and say, Lord, what do you want, me to, what do you want to tell me for me? According to your instruction. That's in Old Testament. It's full of that word. Ponder. It's a word that perhaps we don't use much to ponder. What does it mean to ponder? Is to make one, to make fundamental questions, to ask fundamental questions. And the Lord says, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God." Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Perhaps if I say it, I'll say it backwards. What does it mean to ponder? Wait a minute, Lord. And am I capable of doing that? Am I capable in all circumstances to bring peace? Or do I justify myself because we have to cut off the head of that person? This one messed with me. And so we have to ask ourselves questions because if we don't ask, the Word does not question us and doesn't transform us. The Word not only forms, but transforms. 
I have to go out then with those questions at least repented that I'm not always capable of bringing peace. The first question is if I have peace in my own heart. Because, brothers and sisters, we can't give what we don't have. And when we don't have peace, do you, what, do you know what happens? I don't know if we understand that we don't have peace in the heart. Now with the masks, what happens are our eyeglasses get fogged. That's one of the consequences of the mask. You put it on, all of a sudden everything's fogged. Well, that's nothing compared to not living the word of the Lord. We have our glasses fogged, so I, when I don't have peace, I see you all with glasses that are fogged up. And brothers and sisters with foggy glasses, uh, hmm, who knows what we see. We even see what we don't have. The one who stood up and look, and we, we criticize him, say he's disrespectful. And how about if he stood up because he has backache? And the one maybe who fainted, well, maybe her blood pressure dropped. Well, the one who doesn't have peace in the heart can read anything with peace, can read anything with beauty. The one who doesn't have beauty in the heart is applied to others. Others are ugly. We're always going to be ugly because the person doesn't have beauty in the heart. To guard and reflect the word, brothers and sisters, what Our Lady had to live and St. Joseph was an immense gift beyond that what we can even perceive, like the one we have in the Eucharist. It's an immense gift, but it was a mystery. I love to enter the life of St. Joseph and Our Lady to see them. When they saw the child Jesus, crawling and to think that that's God, that he has to learn how to walk and that he just doesn't get up and then that's it. No, he walked, no. How much mystery involved, how many mysteries involved the life of the Holy Family to live with the greatest gifts, St. Joseph. I love St. Joseph. I can't say the word because he's not poor, he's the richest, but Imagine to live with the two greatest mis mysteries of history, with the Immaculate, the Mother of the Redeemer, and the Redeemer of Man, and placed in his arms under his custody. What a man! Let us applaud to St. Joseph. A man who contemplated the Word made flesh. A man who gave the first crib to the God-made man. And this is not about to romanticize or to put sen over sentiment. It's the truth about the Incarnation. The man who had to wrap him in his mantle so he wouldn't be cold. The man who had to see, look around to see who was there to see if there was an enemy around and to hide the child Jesus and his mother. And well, this talk is not about St. Joseph. Listen to the 19 talks. Papa and sisters, to reflect the word is to know that we are before a gift and a mystery. A mystery that I must, like Jesus said, I love the synagogue, that it, he was unscrolling the roll. We have to unscroll the roll of the word of the Lord because every day the Lord has something new to tell us. And you know something? He says that his word always comes in the opportune moment. It sounds strange, right? Because you always have the Bible. But what does it mean that something's happened to you in your life and all of a sudden you open scripture and when you read that, you read 300 times, all of a sudden you get a light for the situation of the moment because His Word is eternal. It has no time. It has no space. His Word is for each one of us, every circumstance, to illuminate your path, to give you the necessary responses, to guide you, 
and to correct you too. But and sisters, our mother had a total submission of obedience to the word that she listened to. And that's why the plans of God were able to be fulfilled. And what is our mother asking us, everyone to help her triumph, that we say yes to the word of the word, word of the Lord, no matter the cost, no matter the cost to say yes, behold, I am the servant of the Lord, let it be done unto me according to thy word, so that your plans may be fulfilled, because you know that the plans of the Lord it's impressive how when I speak to the young people, I always begin with Jeremiah. Of course, they never heard it, but the first thing I begin to see is the heating of their hearts when I read what Jesus says in Jeremiah. I know very well the plans that I have for you. Plans of prosperity and not of disgrace to assure you a hope. And so when you invoke me and when you supplicate, I will listen to you. Perhaps we don't have to invoke or supplicate to implore the Lord. Do something. We do something that we need her. To accelerate the thing. When you look for me, says the Lord, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart. And here's the key. Do we seek the Lord with all our hearts? And will I let and I will let you find me because I have come for you. Look how beautiful, brothers and sisters. We sang Emmanuel, God was with us. You know something? We applauded very little because we are the only ones in the world that we can say that our God is with us. We're the only ones. There can be very holy people in the religions, but their God is not with them. Here, He is here spiritually, but not with us here present until the end of time. That's why we applauded very little when he was coming out, when he was leaving, because God is Emmanuel who came to place his dwelling among us. And he didn't leave. He stayed with us present in the Eucharist and in his word. Our Lady wants us to learn to relate with the word. And with this, I will finish like she relates. All of you know the Magnificat, right? Well, that's that was like pretty wimpy. I'm going to ask again so you can answer well. Do you all know the Magnificat, right? And a lot of us know that the Magnificat was the canticle of Our Lady when she entered the house of Elizabeth. And what is the Magnifica? It's a canticle of praise to God made by Our Lady. We heard her sing. I tried to imagine that because that voice must have been spectacular. But she sang. It was part of the life of Our Lady to praise the, the Lord singing. Don't stay quiet while we're praising the Lord. But the Magnifica is composed of those who know how to s how to weave will know this better. It's made up of strings. Every phrase is a string of the Old Testament. She she wove a, a song. Every phrase is a phrase of the Old Testament. She knew the word of the Lord. She entered and exited the word. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI says, like someone who comes in and out of his own home. She. Look how beautiful. 
I'm going to try to read it better for you. She identified so well with the word that everything in her was a portrait of the word. We never thought of that, that Our Lady is the living icon of the word of the Lord. She enters completely in the word and leaves with such great, nat so naturally, and that's how we have to evangelize. It's not like open Bible, hitting them with their head, not fighting with the people. It's with arguments illumined by the word. It's with words illumined by the word. We don't have to say no because this and John 15, this. You already know what John 15 says, so you just say, you speak with your argument, with your words, what the gospel says. Very natural, like Our Lady would do so. It's a speak and think with the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord becomes her own word. The word of the Lord becomes hers. That is, she doesn't say anything that the word of the Lord doesn't say. A great examination of conscience. And her word is born of the word of the Lord. Everything that she says, everything that she inspires, everything that she shows us comes from the word of the Lord. Her wanting is a wanting to be with God. She is intimately penetrated by the word of the Lord. And that's why she could become a mother of the word made flesh. Our Lady wants brothers and sisters that we help her in her triumph. But perhaps we don't think that the triumph has anything to do with the gospel. And however, the world, and every time more, and doesn't know the word of the Lord, doesn't know anything about the gospel. And who has to proclaim the Christ of the gospel, not an invented Christ, not even a Catholic faith, according to how I think. No, the one that the Lord gave us from the beginning. Brothers and sisters, we are the ones who have to be living witnesses of the gospel. But to be living witnesses of the gospel, we have to be like her. Men and women full, penetrated completely by the word. Notice that Peter, you know how Peter was, right? But Peter had something very beautiful. The miraculous catch. Raise your hands if we, you, we need in humanity today. One catch, not only one catch, but thousands of miraculous catches. And every day more. In every place, in all sectors. And perhaps we feel like Peter, that we work and work and work and we don't even catch one fish. Sometimes that happens to us. And Peter came upset because he spent the whole night fishing and didn't catch one fish. And the Lord comes to contradict us, sign of contradiction, not because he wants to contradict us, because he will contradict everything that opposes him and his will. And Peter comes complaining, I've been all night, fishing, blah, blah. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, put out to the deep, in the right, and cast the net to the right. Can you imagine the face of Peter? He didn't say that because he was respectful. But brothers and sisters, what Peter was saying was logical, right? For man, but not for God. And we have to allow ourselves to be questioned by the logic of God, which is in his word. And so Peter looks at the Lord and he says, am I, did I understand that correctly? And he sees the sea and he says, but I've been, I've been all night fishing 
and then catch one fish. Put out to the deep and throw the net to the right. And Peter answers the most beautiful thing that we can answer. Before something so mysterious, so contrary to what we want to do, or our logic, because according to our logic, we're so logical. And Peter says, I will do so. To your word. At your word, I will do so, because you say, I will do so. But sisters, we don't understand anything of what's happening, and everything seems to go backwards of what should be. Let us listen to the Lord, truly. And even though He tells you something that you don't want to do, and what seems illogical, say like Peter, at your word, I will do so. Just like Our Lady, if you say it, let it be done unto me. And we have the miraculous catch because Peter obeyed without understanding. The problem of our culture is that it only obeys when it understands. And if it's convinced, if the mind is convinced that I have to obey, that's not obedience, brothers and sisters. Obedience is to believe in the one who is telling us what we have to do. It's a God who loves us and that has to form us as he has to form Peter. And that's why it's important that every day we read sacred scripture, one verse, one verse. When we do the questions, we had Lexio Divina. Return, what questions to ask in Lexio Divina to bear the greatest fruit in the prayer for reading of the gospel. But also, as Sister Anna says, Many years we have been, many years ago, Mother wrote the enthronement of the Word. So on December 25th, when the Word is made flesh, is revealed, the Word made flesh is revealed to the world, we place it in a central place in our, in our homes. And what do we say with that? Here we do what He says, like Peter. And only when we do that, when we give the testament to your grandchildren, uncles, every family member, that the word is enthroned. Do it this year, December 25th, with all your family members. Because in this house we will live according to the word of the Lord. Me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. May the Lord bless you. We will pray the prayer to the child Jesus, beginning the novena. And everyone present in your interior the intentions to the child Jesus. I want to give thanks to the child Jesus, St. Joseph and Our Lady for a great miracle they obtained for us. God the Father of infinite charity, who so loved the world, who so loved, loved man, who so loved the world that He gave Your only begotten Son so that made man in the womb of Our Lady, He was born in a manger for our health and our remedy. We thank You for such a sovereign benefit. Grateful, we offer You all the virtues of Your Son, supplicating by the divine merits of Your birth, by Your poverty, humility, and by all the wombs that you poured in the manger to dispose of our hearts like you, hum a humble dwelling forever. That we may receive you there, cleanse of sin with profound humility, with love enkindled, and with attachment to everything earthly. To you, Blessed Mother, Sovereign Blessed Mother, that by your great virtues and especially by your humility, God wanted, God chose you to be, to, for you to be His Mother. We supplicate to you that you yourself prepare and dispose my soul 
and of all for the spiritual birth of our adorable son, for your adorable son. Oh, sweet tender mother, communicate to me with profound recollection and tender love with with which you received him. To love and adore him for all eternity. O oh, Saint Joseph, spouse of the Virgin Mary and virginal father of Jesus. Thanks be to God, he chose you to respond with so much virtue. God granted you with many gifts to such an excellent greatness. I beg you by the love that you had for the divine child, you helped me to have the same fervor to receive him in the Eucharist. Oh, remember, oh, sweet, tender little child Jesus, that you told the Venerable Margaret of the Blessed Sacrament. Everything that you ask, ask by the merits of my infancy, and nothing will be denied to you. Full of confidence in you, O oh Jesus, you, you who are the same truth, we come recognizing that we are sinners. Help us to live a holy life, to attain blessedness. We offer ourselves to you, O oh, omnipotent child, sure that our hope is in you, and by virtue of divine promises, you will receive our supplications. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of death. Amen. Holy Family, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.